Hello, man. Good morning. Hey, what a powerful time of worship that was. One of the manliest things you could do in this life is place your hands in the air and sing to King Jesus. Amen? Hey, I want to say just thank you, Pastor Bill, for having me. It's an honor. I don't know if you guys know this, but Bill is an amazing man of God and a faithful shepherd of his word and his people. I'll follow Bill as he follows Jesus any day of the week. And, and, and from what I hear, God is on the move at this church too. And he, people are finding Jesus. People are growing in the word and in the Lord. And so it's just an honor to be here today. I'm really thankful. Um, I mentioned earlier, and I, so I grew up in Amarillo. We gotta talk about that real quick before we get in the word. It's so cool to be back. I was born in Arkansas. Anyone from Arkansas? Just, uh, I was, oh, we got one, How, right on. Uh, I was born in Arkansas, and then when I was three years old, moved to Amarillo, and all my elementary school and junior high school years were right here in Amarillo. Did anyone go to Puckett? Any Puckett Panthers here? A couple? Anyone? Uh, I think at the time it was called Westover, but I think they call it West Plains now, the junior high. Anyone go to West Plains? Okay, a couple. Well, hey, it's good to be back. I haven't been back in 27 years. And so we live down in Austin now. My family and I, we started a church there about four years ago. And what a blessing it is to be back, uh, just going down memory lane. I took my kids to Big Texan <laughs> the first night we got here, and, and then we went and sprayed the Cadillacs yesterday with the spray paint. So and they're having a good time too. But today we're here to get in the Word of God. And I, I don't believe it's an accident that you're here. I don't believe in accidents. I, I don't believe in random occurrences or, or coincidences. I believe that God is sovereign over all things and that his spirit is moving in the affairs of mankind and that he brought you here for a reason today. And there's things he wants to minister to you and to your heart this morning. And so we're gonna have two messages today. The first one, we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you wanna open there. This is gonna be our theme section of scripture, our theme verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the theme of this conference this year is steadfast. If you're near a neighbor, turn to them, look at them and say, bro, be steadfast. <laughs> We're gonna break down that verse today, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, in this first session this morning to try to, as best as we can in, in 45 minutes, gain a deep understanding of what God is trying to communicate to us. Actually, if you're okay with it, could, could we just all stand and let's read the verse together out loud. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Let's read it together out loud and then I'll pray. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Lord, help us to be steadfast. That's your word here for us today, Lord, that we would not be moved, God, by the things of this world, that we would abound in your work always, and that we would know that it matters, that it's not in vain. Anything that's done in your name, Jesus, is not in vain. And so, Lord, minister to our hearts today. I pray for good soil in our hearts. I pray that I would honor you today in the things spoken, that I would simply be a vessel through which your Holy Spirit would flow to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Awesome, praise God. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. How do you say strong? How, how do you stay steadfast in a moving world? You know the... The cultures and currents of this world are drifting and moving. The ideologies, right? There, there's stuff everywhere in this world. How does the Christian man remain steadfast in his faith, and what does that look like? Actually, I like the picture. Do we have the, the picture of the, just the theme of the conference? Uh, I think it was of a sailboat. It was a guy. Yeah, so when I grew up in Amarillo, we would go to Fritch every now and then, my family and I, and, and we would go sailing at Lake Meredith. And... And I, I don't know if that picture's from Lake Meredith or not. It looks like it could be. But, but there's a determination there in, in the picture of sailing a boat. You're charting a course. You're factoring the wind. You, you have an idea in mind of where you're going. There's a steadfastness, you could say. Today, we're gonna be looking at two messages. This first one is really gonna impact our thinking, prayerfully. How do we think rightly about our Christian walk? Doctrine, understanding, theology, because godly information should then lead to godly transformation, amen? The things we understand rightly about the Lord with our heads should cause us to live rightly with our hands. Yes. 
So the first message today is gonna be a lot of head understanding, and that's good, that's healthy. And then the next message today will be a practical application of how do we go and live that out. And so if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're gonna look at a, a couple portions, but I, what I'd like to do is break verse 58 today into three segments. And actually the Greek in its original lang language, it calls for this. There's three questions. What should we be as Christian men? Well, we should be steadfast and immovable. What should we do as Christian men? Well, we should abound in the work of the Lord, amen? amen. And then what should we know? We should know that our labor is not in vain. So those are gonna be the three ways we're gonna look at this verse this morning. And, and before we actually break down those three questions, we, we gotta talk about something really important here. We can't miss this. Can I just take a verse out of the Bible and make it mean whatever I want it to mean? Is that good? <laughs> is that good? Is that, that's not good, that's not healthy. What do we need if we're gonna be looking at any verse in the Bible? We need context. Context is king. Who's the author? Who's the audience? What type of literature is it in the Bible? Is this, is this a poetic book? Is it a prophetic book? Is it historical? What's the first three words? If you guys look in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren. We've got some context there, don't we? We know the author is the apostle Paul. He's writing to the church in Corinth. So the author is a steadfast man himself. This was a guy who loved God at one portion in his life, but had a wrong direction on that loving of the Lord. He was zealous for God, but he was killing Christians in the process. And then God met him on the road to Damascus and rocked his world, changed his life, and he became steadfast for the gospel, planting churches all around the known world. And then he plants a church in Corinth, and now he's writing a letter to that church. So we've got some context here, don't we? We know the author is a Christian man who loves the Lord and is steadfast in his faith. And he's writing to a church. It says, to the beloved brethren. That's to the family of God. That's to the men of God here today, the loved Christian family of God. So this is not a message for the world. This is a message for the Christian, the beloved brethren. And he says this, he says, therefore, which means we gotta know what was said before that. So let me just give you a, a brief synopsis of what was said in chapter 15. And if this doesn't pump you up, I don't know what will. This is gospel right here. A quick synopsis of chapter 15 is so important in context to know what we're talking about today. In verses one and two of chapter 15, he talks about the gospel being the most important thing. Does anyone know that that's true? The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most important thing? I hope it is. He says this is of most importance, of first importance. And then in verses three and four, he tells us what the gospel is. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again, amen? So the most important thing in life is that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again, amen? And then in verses five through eight, he says, and there were a lot of witnesses of this. James was a witness, Peter was a witness, the 12 were, apostles were a witness. He even says over 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus at once. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, and people saw him in his resurrected body. And in verses nine through 11, Paul says, I, I'm actually a witness by the grace of God. Paul himself is a witness of the resurrected Jesus. And then in verse 12, he calls something out. He says, but some say, we don't know who these some are, apparently there were some hecklers there in Corinth, some trash talkers, and they, and they were saying, some were saying there is no resurrection of the dead. Uh-oh, conflict. You know, the world conflicts with the gospel, doesn't it? Some say there's no resurrection of the dead. Well, in verses 13 through 16, Paul says, well, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Christ didn't rise from the dead, and if that's true, then our faith and our preaching is useless. As a matter of fact, if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, what are we even doing here this morning? This is, my preaching today is empty and vain if this isn't true. That's what Paul says. And in verses 17 through 19, he says, actually, if there's no resurrection, then all your loved ones who have perished, they're not in heaven, they're gone. And he says, we're all still stuck in our sin and we should be pitied because there's no salvation for sin. But then in verses 20 through 23, he, he makes the, the most beautiful statement in the Bible. He says, but Christ is risen from the dead, amen? And he says, not only has Christ risen from the dead, which is great because we have salvation for sin and access to heaven, he says, but Christ is the first fruits of us who will rise again. So because Jesus conquered sin and conquered death and rose again, we also who are found in him 
will rise again into glorious eternal salvation. He's the first fruits. And then in verses 24 through 28 of chapter 15, Paul says, and by the way, Christ is coming again. He's coming back. And he's coming back to rule and to reign. And a final judgment is coming over planet Earth. And then in verses 29 through 34, he talks about the Christian life having purpose, which is what we're gonna talk about this morning. Uh, And he says, don't be deceived, but awaken to righteousness. And by the way, he's speaking to Corinthians who are easily deceived. We can be easily deceived in this world. Our world today is very much like Corinth, struggling with idolatry, false religious systems, sexuality, trade, money, commerce. I mean, you name it that we struggle with, the things today, that's Corinth. He says, hey, don't be deceived by the things of the world. Awake to righteousness. Verses 35 through 49, he reminds us that we're all getting glorious new bodies someday. Anyone thankful for that? Anyone wake up this morning with aches and pains and creaks and groans and moans? (laughs) We're We're getting upgrades someday, right? Your old rusty tractor is gonna get a Ferrari in heaven or whatever that looks like, right? And then he, in verses 50 through 53, he talks about the fact that we're gonna be taken away from this world, the believers are, that in the twinkling of an eye, in the flash, in the nanosecond of a moment, at the sound of the last trumpet, boom, believers are gone, into glory. And then he says in verses 54 through 57 that death itself is swallowed up in victory because of the gospel, and there's no more sting to death. The Christian has no fear of death. Actually, for the Christian, death is an upgrade. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Right now, I'm living for Jesus, and that's awesome, but when I die, I get all of him. I get eternal, I get to sing those praises for the rest of my life in eternal glory and perfection. And then he says, in the final verse, verse 57, he says, actually, can we put this one on the screen? I think I had referenced it a little later. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just read that again so you guys can see it. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is anyone pumped up? (laughs) That that pumps me up for the gospel. That's the context. And then Paul says, therefore. So based on the fact that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, he conquered death, he is the savior, he did rise from the dead, our sins are forgiven, we are gonna resurrect into heavenly glory, we will get upgraded bodies, death has no sting, and we have victory in this current life through the gospel, therefore, now our verse today. That changes the way we look at this verse. We don't just jump right into it. Now we have the context, it matters. Being steadfast as Christian men in this life matters. Why? Because the gospel is real and Jesus really is coming back and people really are gonna be judged for their sin. And so the way we live actually matters. And we only have so much time, amen? Amen. So the first question, we're we're gonna look at this text today. Verse 58 is all we're gonna look at in this first session this morning. And the first question is, what should we be? And the answer is two words, say them out loud. Steadfast and immovable. Now, I love language study. I love the breakdown of words themselves and syntax, where they fit in sentences. I think it matters in the Bible. Every single word and the structure of the words in the Bible are their own purpose. And so in this first study, we're gonna look at a little bit of the sentence structure and the word studies because they matter in helping us understand what God is trying to communicate to us this morning. So steadfast and immovable are one command in the Greek. It's actually a command. You guys, men here today, if you love Jesus, if you're one of the beloved brethren, you are commanded by God to be two things, steadfast and immovable. So we're gonna look at those. And even the, the, the command itself, be, ginomai is the Greek word, and it's in the middle tense. I love this stuff, this matters. Let's do a quick breakdown of an action, of a command. An active verb is to do something. A passive verb is something happened to you. If I kick my dog, it's messed up, but that's an active verb. I kicked the dog. If the dog kicks me, that's passive. I got kicked. You tracking with me? One thing I'm doing, the other thing, it happened to me. Well, this verb here, your command by God today is in the middle tense, which we don't really have this in English. It means as you're choosing to do it, it's happening to you as you're doing it. There's some fascinating words in the Greek that are in the middle tense. Prayer, 
in the Greek, in the New Testament, is in the middle tense. As you choose to pray, you know what's happening? Prayer's happening to you. Go, in the Greek. As you're going, you got goad, right? As I choose to go, what happens? I'm going as I choose to go, you understand? So this command here, be, it actually means become. You must choose to be steadfast and immovable in the gospel. But as you make that choice, that commitment, yeah, God, I'm gonna follow you, guess what happens? You start becoming steadfast. As I choose to read the word, the word reads me. As I choose to follow Jesus, Jesus blesses that. So we are commanded to become steadfast and immovable. Steadfast is the first word. It carries the idea of being firmly planted, a firm foundation. You're not fickle, Christian man, you're stable. You're not floating around, you're tethered, you're anchored, you could say. You're not a squishy bowl of jelly. (laughs) <laughs> right, you're a strong Christian man in this life. You get the idea, right? Steadfast, it's firm. But there's a little more meaning to the word. It's not just about being fixed in place. The word actually carries a connotation that you're moving in a fixed direction. You, ha- you have a course charted. You're steadfast in aim. Picture you have a gun, you're at a shooting range. You're steadfast on that target. There's an aim, there's a course that's been set. There's an endurance, there's a tenacity, You're not wishy-washy, are you, Christian man? Just being tossed around by the ideologies and false religions of this life? No, not the steadfast man. The steadfast man knows who he is. He has a secure identity in the gospel. I know who I am and I know where I'm going. Why? Because we just read 1 Corinthians 15 and it told me who I am and where I'm going. I'm steadfast in the gospel, amen? We keep going and we don't give up. That's what the word means. Can I just say that again? We keep going and we don't give up. Maybe there's a Christian man that needs to hear that today, struggling in life. Does God even hear my prayers? Does he even notice me? Is he aware that I'm, yeah, he's aware, he loves you, he sees you. You don't give up and you keep going. That's steadfast. And it's not always easy. There will be opposition. There will be storms in life that come. Now here's a question, are you willing to stand for the gospel even if you're the only one standing? That's being steadfast. If you're the only Christian in your workplace, are you willing to be the Christian in your workplace and have it be known? That's steadfast. That's what the word means. Uh, You know, this idea of charting a course, it made me think of my little brother, Matthew. He grew up with me here in Amarillo. He's in the Navy now. He's actually gonna retire from the Navy next year as a nuclear electrician. He was a dumb kid growing up. I don't know how he got so smart. But you know the submarines and the aircraft carriers, are they're nuclear powered, right? And, and so he's a nuclear electrician, but th- that's not the point. The point is, as I wanna talk just for a brief moment about the aircraft carrier itself. You know, it goes out into the ocean, crosses the Atlantic, and planes come and go, waves beat and bash against the boat. There's squalls, there's wind, there's storms, but the aircraft carrier just presses on and, right, and spreads right through that water through, through to its destination, doesn't it? You put a jet ski in the Atlantic Ocean with those same waves and wind, what happens? That thing's engulfed, that thing's tossed, you're done, right? The picture here is an aircraft carrier. You know what? The waves are gonna beat your boat. Planes are gonna come and go. Friends are gonna leave. Stuff's gonna happen. You're gonna go through the atmosphere of life, but the aircraft carrier charts its course and it's steadfast in direction, amen? That's that's kind of a picture of what's being talked about here in this word, that we would be aircraft carriers for the gospel, not jet skis easily tossed around. And I wanna read for you a verse that's a great benefit. There's a benefit to being steadfast, do you know that? I mean, there are many benefits. Let me give you just one. This is Isaiah 26, 3. I think we can have this one on the screen. Uh, This is the Hebrew word for steadfast, but the same uh, application. Christian man, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So one of the results of being a steadfast man in the gospel, with your eyes fixed on Jesus in the gospel, is that you get perfect peace. Actually, in the Hebrew there, it's shalom, shalom. In the Hebrew, you put the same word next to each other twice and it emphasizes it. The Christian man who's steadfast on the gospel gets double shalom. So when the world's falling apart and everyone else is frantic, the Christian man is not. Why? He has double shalom. His his eyes are fixed on the Lord and the gospel. He knows who he is and he knows where he's going. Amen? So that's being being steadfast. Even in my office uh, where I do a lot of my study, I have a Rembrandt painting of Mark chapter four where the disciples are in the storm and they're frantic and fearful and who's asleep with his head on the pillow? Jesus, and if Jesus is chilling with his head on the pillow, I'm pretty sure I could be too, right? 
I don't have to be frantic and white knuckling it. I can have shalom even in the storm. That's steadfast. The other part that we're commanded is to be immovable. Everyone say immovable. immovable. It's a little different than steadfast, but it's pretty much the same. Uh, steadfast, uh, steadfast means that, that you're firmly planted, you, you, you've charted your course. You know what immovable means in the Greek? Immovable. <laughs> you're not to be moved. Do you start in Christianity and then stray to some other God at some point? No. No, you don't. That's being what? That's being movable. We're immovable. We're anchored. The tides of current will throw, flow through culture, but we're not to be moved. We're, we're the steadfast man for the gospel. I wish I could do a good accent of this. This is the Hawaiian pigeon translation of this verse. No let nothing shake you guys up, man. Right? That's immovable. Don't let anything shake you up. Are you shaken in life? Turning to things that might numb it? You know, I, I wanna encourage you, if you're taking notes here this morning, Psalm 46, just make note of that. Make note of it and read it. Psalm 46 is a picture of when life falls apart. It says when the earth melts, when the earth is moved, when the mountains shake, when the rivers roar, steadfast man still trusts in God and finds his refuge in him. And, and actually in that, in that chapter, it says there's a, there's a river who makes glad the city of God. So in the middle of mountains quaking and rivers roaring and earth melting, there's a beautiful river that leads to peace and holiness and life. The point of that psalm, Psalm 46, is that the, the righteous isn't shaken by the earth melting. The righteous isn't shaken by the rivers roaring. And the rivers will roar in this life. The mountains will shake in this life. But you're not moved from the gospel, are you? Matthew 7, uh, Matthew 7 is Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus would put it this way. He would say, uh, there's two guys. They each build a house. You guys know the story, right? One builds his house on the sand. And the other builds his house on the, the rock. The, the wind and the storm and the waves, they come to both houses. Both houses get shaken. One gets washed away. That's the sand. But the man who hears the word of the Lord and does the word of the Lord is the man who builds his house upon the rock. He's not shaken. He's Psalm 46. When the mountains shake, he's still standing. That's the picture of immovable. You got the idea? We are steadfast and we're not to be moved. As a matter of fact, you can make a great argument that when life shakes, not only does the, the steadfast man not run from the Lord, but he runs to the Lord. Amen. He doesn't run away from church. He presses in harder at church because he knows and he understands. Now, let me give you an example of someone who, 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 was, who was moved. What's the opposite of immovable? Not reliant, not consistent, not trustworthy. Here's why. Having loved this present world, he was moved the world away from the gospel. You ever know anyone that that's happened to? A prodigal, right? Once was growing up in the Lord, and then they went to college and heard some philosophy of a professor, started having some friends affirm whatever that is, and next thing you know, they're moved because they have loved this present world. That's not good. That, that's the call. That's why you're here today is that you would be reminded, hey, I'm steadfast and I'm not to be moved. I'm not a demon. Let me show you some guys who are immovable in the Bible. Guys who don't just take the bait of the shiny lure. Because here's the truth. You might've heard this quote before and I love it. Any dead fish can float downstream, but it takes a live one to swim against the current. And the stream's gonna move but the steadfast man swims against that. And so let me just give you three examples. The first one is a guy named Shema or Shama. And this is in 2 Samuel 23. This is a list of David's mighty warriors, the mighty men of God. And there's one guy who's really manly in that passage too. His name is Benaiah. It says he slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Man, that's a men's conference message right there for another time. <laughs> slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. But you know, a few verses before that, it talks about this guy Shema that we could easily quickly look over. Later, go read about it. I think it's in verse 11 in 2 Samuel 23. And Shema, Shema, he... He was in a field of lentils. One translation says a field of beans. 
And the Philistines were coming and he had people with him and it said that everyone on his side fled and he stood there in the field of beans and guarded it. And he slew every Philistine that came into that field. And and the verse after that says, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Why did the Lord have a great victory that day? Because one man stood in the field and said, I won't be moved. Even if everyone else runs, I'm standing. Man, that's a powerful message. And it made me think too, sometimes we can feel like all we're doing is guarding the beans. <laughs> we're like, hey, what I'm doing, it really doesn't matter. It's just a field of lentils. You know what it mattered to the Lord? The Lord said, hey, Shema, that's a great victory that day. To everyone else, that might have seemed silly and stupid. So another guy that wasn't moved, well, these verses we could put on the screen real quickly. This is Acts 20. This is the Apostle Paul who, who the Lord is using to write this letter. But this is him in the book of Acts. And it says this, Paul says, see, right now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. Here it is. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. Amen. He knew danger awaited him. He said, the Holy Spirit has been testifying to me that I'm gonna go and I'm gonna get arrested, that I'm gonna go and get pummeled. He said, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself anymore. That's a ste- Could we say that's a steadfast, immovable man? Yeah. He, he, he can write what we're reading today because he himself is living it. And then we have Peter and John, two of the other apostles. This is in Acts 4, and then we'll move on. Acts 4, verses 18 through 20. The Sanhedrin, the religious rulers, called them, Peter and John, and commanded them, hey, guys, don't speak at all anymore or teach in the name of Jesus. You know, that's happening in our world today, right? Can't talk about Jesus there, 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 there. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whatever is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. However, for us... We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They said, we understand what you're saying. And as respectfully as we can push back, we're gonna keep sharing the name of Jesus. Why? Because the gospel is the most important thing. It's of first importance. That's verse one of chapter 15. And if the gospel is the most important thing and and Jesus is actually coming back and people really really are going to hell, then you can't silence the name of Jesus. Not at least in my life. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna be like punk rock and rebellious and kicking stuff over, right? You can be respectful in the way you push back, but you're not to be moved from the gospel, amen? That's the point. All right, three quick notes, and then we're gonna move on to our next point. Uh, The first note, again, I love language. Steadfast and immovable in the Greek are actually adjectives. And an adjective describes a noun. For example, if I said I had a steak, what kind of steak was it? A delicious steak. It was a large steak. It was a 72 ounce steak. I don't know, it was, a, it was, right? That's the type of steak it was. Here, he writes to the beloved brethren, us today, the Christian man. And steadfast and immovable are adjectives that describe you or should describe you at least. The Christian man is steadfast and immovable or should be. And then the second thing I wanna say is I hinted at it a minute ago, This whole conversation of being steadfast and immovable is good and righteous and holy, and we're called to it by the word of God. But we can't do all that at the forsaking of grace, love, and tenderness, and kindness. You know we're called to those things too, don't you? It's not that we're just to be a prideful, stubborn, steadfast jerk. (laughs) That's That's not the call, is it? You have to compare scripture with other scripture. We are to be steadfast and immovable, but we can do that tenderly and gently and graciously and lovingly, amen? And then the third thing is that I wanna say is that this doesn't happen by accident. You don't just stumble into Christian maturity. You're not gonna be a strong, steadfast man just by accident because you came to church one Sunday. It takes discipline. It takes reading your word. It takes being around Christian brothers. This is a steadfast thing you've done today by being here. But if this is all you did, you're not gonna be steadfast five months from now. It takes Christian discipline, drinking of the water of life, meditating on the word of God day and night. That's the man that's planted like a tree by the rivers of living water. So, so my argument there that I wanna make, which is a biblical argument, is don't just try harder to be a steadfast man of the gospel. That doesn't really work. 
dive deeper into the gospel and you will become the thing you're supposed to be, which is steadfast and immovable. Don't try to be steadfast, just fall more in love with Jesus. Read his word and you will become steadfast, amen? All right, so the second question, and these next two points are much quicker, but still equally as important. The next question is, what should we do? Maybe we'll put that one on the screen. What should we do? And the answer is we should be, what does it say? Always abounding. That's what the verse calls for. We know what we are to be, steadfast and immovable, but what do we do? Well, we always abound. Always means always. Anywhere, everywhere, all the time. No breaks. Jeez, man, no breaks? That's right, no breaks. You don't ever hit the pause button on your Christianity, do you? I'm pretty sure my Bible says once I'm covered by the blood of the lamb, I'm covered by the blood of the lamb. I don't, there's no pause button on that. It's not like I can walk in this place and Jesus isn't with me. No, he is and is grieving if I go there. I'm to always be abounding. You know, there's no division between the, the secular and the sacred. If you're doing that in your life, that, that's, that's an inaccurate understanding of the gospel. And what I mean by that, it's not like you have your church life and then you have your fun life. For the Christian steadfast man, that, that doesn't exist. Everywhere you go, you bring Jesus. You bring the fragrance of Christ into that place. Whether you realize it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you feel it or not, you are a Christian, period. And therefore, you're always to be abounding in the work of God. Colossians would say, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. So who cares what job you have? You all got different jobs. Wherever God put you, you are to be abounding in the work of the Lord in that place. Actually, the way you work, just the way you work, the attitude you have, the effort you put in, that is abounding. That's representing Jesus just by your simple effort. The way you love your wives and children, the way you serve at church, all of it is wrapped up in that word abounding. Abounding means to excel, exceed, or overflow. You know Psalm 23, it says, my cup overfloweth. The picture of abounding is, is that. It's not just a normal amount, it's an exceeding amount. So for the steadfast man who truly is rooted and understands the gospel, he is always overflowing in his Christianity. Not only has the Lord done a work in him, but everywhere he goes, there's a work being done through him. It's a, it's a picture of a river overflowing its banks. There's a couple of connotations to this word abounding. One is to flourish. Doesn't mean life will be easy, but there, there can be a flourishing even in the middle of hard times, right? Amen. A second uh, way you can look at it is it means an abundance. Like some of you, when you were younger, you had an abundance of hair on your head. <laughs> you might not anymore, right? I'll be there someday too. You had an abundance of something. Another way you could say it is plethora. Right? You get a plethora of pinatas. You have a lot of pinatas. You get a, it's enough synonyms. You get the point, right? It means a lot. What does the opposite of abounding then look like? Lazy, complacent, lethargic. Uh oh. I hope I'm not ex describing one of our Christian walks here this morning. Actually, I am. I do hope I'm describing one of our Christian walks here this morning, so the Lord can can hit His finger on that button for you this morning, Amen. because He loves you right. and He cares for you. And he desires that you would be always abounding. We're not called to be lazy, lethargic, complacent, apathetic people in this world. Not the steadfast man. Not the man who understands all the gospel stuff we just read. That man knows who he is and knows where he's going and he lives it out abundantly. Jesus came to give life and life in the fullest, abundant life. You know a lazy Christian is an oxymoron. You know what an oxymoron is? It's two words that don't go together, like giant baby or freezer burn or all natural artificial sweetener. Right? Wait, I could go on for days. I've got a bunch listed here. Alone together, seriously funny, soft rock. What even is that? Right? Like all these words that don't go together. And a lazy Christian doesn't go together. If you're doing nothing for the kingdom of God, do you really understand the kingdom of God? That's the call in this verse. If we're breaking down this verse today, that's the call. We are to be steadfast, not move, and doing some work for the kingdom. It's always abounding in the work of the Lord. NIV translation says, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. The steadfast Christian man does not just fly under the radar his whole life in his Christianity not being detected as being a Christian in all the places he goes. Uh-oh, that's not a steadfast man. 
He is known for his Christianity. It's not hidden. We are to be abounding in the work of the Lord. The Greek word there for work, it means work. It means effort. It means energy. It means elbow grease. It means sweat. And it can range from preaching a message to leading people to Christ to giving a stranger a cold cup of water on a hot day that no one will ever see. Is that not also still the work of the Lord? The way you treat your wife when you have a long day and you don't feel like treating your family well because you're frustrated, but you go home and you pray it up and you ask the Lord for strength, you ask the Spirit for help, and you're a little kind that evening. Hey, that's the work of the Lord, is it not? The way you serve at church, on the greeting team, welcoming a stranger coming into the church, that's the work of the Lord. The way you sweep the back room when no one's looking, We need rest sometimes. We have to balance these things out. We need rest. It's healthy to have times of refreshing and replenishment and Sabbath and rest. But I got, I got to point something out that this, that this verse, I think, is calling for. We can make leisure an idol sometimes. We can, we can get to a place in our head space where all we're living for is the vacation and the stuff. And not that the vacation and the stuff are inherently bad. I think God wants to bless us with those things at times. But if all we're living for is that, if all we're striving for is leisure, then we have a misunderstanding of rest and Sabbath. And what's being called for here is actually the opposite of that, that you would overflow in your labor for the kingdom, that you would actually put in a little elbow grease for Jesus. Because if not us, then who? Who's gonna work for Jesus on planet earth if not us? Paul would say, I pour myself out like a drink offering in Philippians 2, he would say, I toil day and night not to be a burden on anyone in 1 Thessalonians 2. So the point of this portion is that we're not called to live a chill, comfortable Christian life. And if your Christian life is easy, you're doing it wrong, right? So the, this is an exhortive section of scripture, isn't it? You, you probably sense that in the room. Okay, this is a strong exhortation, or maybe even for some of us, man, that's a, that's a loving rebuke I'm hearing from the Lord. Praise God. But he's also a loving shepherd and he cares about you. It's not just that the Lord wants you to be steadfast and immovable and abound in his work so he can accomplish all this work somewhere else. He also cares about what's happening in you, your soul, your mental health, your heart, as we talked about this morning as we were opening up. And that's why I love the next part that he leads us to is that we know something. We know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because as we're abounding in God's work, as we're seeking to be steadfast and immovable, God says, hey, I also want you to know something, son of God, man of God here today, that your efforts matter. He doesn't want you to be discouraged in that. You know, Jesus, he came to give overflowing, abundant, abounding life. But you know that same verse in in John 10, 10, it says the enemy comes to seek, kill, and destroy, and destroy, a roar, like a roaring lion, destroy. I kind of blended those words. He, he comes like a roaring lion to seek, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life and life in the fullest. So as you're seeking to be a man of God, steadfast, not being moved, abounding in God's work, the enemy's gonna wanna rip you off, thought life and your prayer life. He wants to steal that steadfastness. He wants you to move. He wants you to think that cold cup of water was meaningless, that it was in vain. The Lord doesn't want you to be discouraged today. In our final look at breaking down this verse, there's something he wants us to know. He wants us to know that our labor is what? Not in vain. Vain means useless, empty. But this verse says your labor is not that, which means then what? Your efforts for the kingdom matter. Eternally they matter. And by the way, it says that, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All this stuff we're talking about here today, it's not my ministry, it's not my church, it's not my work, it's all his. It's all by his grace and for his glory. We're just invited to be a part of it, and that's a blessing. We get to be his ambassadors. So what we're doing today matters. How you treat people matters. How you serve, it matters. The enemy wants you to think it doesn't, but it does. Paul had the right perspective in another section of scripture. We can put this on the screen, 2 Corinthians 4, 18. For we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are seen are eternal. That has the right perspective. 1 Corinthians 15 was eternal things, wasn't it? I know who I am, I know where I'm going. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, he's the first fruits, we're all going to glory someday. Amen. Amen. So therefore, my efforts unto the kingdom are not in vain. They matter from an eternal perspective. So here's, here's the ways that, that the enemy will try to rip you off, and then we'll close this first session. Because if we're talking about knowing that it's not in vain, well, what are the temptations that our mind will play on us? One, maybe, I, I bet you all have fallen into some of these categories. One, you're not seeing immediate results for your kingdom work. You're saying, ah, it doesn't matter. You know that, that, that ministry, which you're all called to, by the way, you know you're all called to full-time ministry? Remember, remember, you don't hit the pause button on your Christianity? You're all called to full-time ministry. And I think sometimes if we're putting work in for the kingdom and we don't see immediate results, we can think, ah, what's the point? Because we're so used to our paycheck earning system. I put in the hours, I get my paycheck. I put in the hours, I get my paycheck. Well, I'm putting the hours for Christianity and I'm not getting the paycheck. I'm not seeing the person receive Christ. I'm not seeing them, so you give up. Well, you know in the kingdom of God, there's delayed fruit sometimes. You know that you're, you might just be called to plant seeds and someone else is called to water it later, but those seeds needed to be planted. Amen. You might not even know the, the result of your efforts until you get to heaven someday. So that's one pitfall is if we don't see immediate results, we're moved, we give up. A second one, you compare yourself to others. That's a pitfall, isn't it? What if your work of the Lord is different than your neighbor's work of the Lord? Well, guess what? It probably is gonna be. There are some things we're all called to do, share the gospel, be good witnesses, show compassion, but he has specific giftings and callings for each of us. So don't fall in the trap of comparing your labor to your brother's labor, because if you do that, you might think your labor's in vain. Some temptation might be, well, ministry's for the professional gifted Christians. That's false theology. There's no such thing. It's not like I'm up here because I'm stronger in the Lord than you. No, we're all mighty men of God, strong in the Lord. We're just all serving in our different giftings and callings. And I think the temptation to, is to think, well, if I'm not on stage or I'm not on staff, then my, my ministry's useless. It's vain. Nope, wrong. That's wrong thinking, isn't it? Amen? What, what about this one? Uh, no one notices. No one notices my efforts. Okay? You know who does? Look at Hebrews 6.10. Put this one on the screen. For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. Even if no one in this world notices your work for the kingdom, God does, and he rewards that. Some of you might think, well, I don't have much to offer. Welcome to the club, right? Fish and loaves. Lord, here's my, here's my, here's my fish and chips. This is all I got. The Lord says, great, I'm gonna use that. Yeah. What do you have? Be faithful with it. But Lord, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. I can't serve you. My ministry will be useless because I used to be a fill in the blank. Well, I'm pretty sure that's every person the Bible God has called. Yeah, Paul was a murderer. Matthew was a tax collector. David was an adulterer. Can't use their past as an excuse. I'm too young. Well, I'm pretty sure the Bible, Paul would encourage Timothy, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth. I'm too old. Noah started building the ark when he was 480 years old. It's a little late for retirement, <laughs> right? Like, there's, what, what excuse do we have to say, well, my ministry would be meaningless? We don't have one. We are to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, each as individual men of God, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That all of us have a place and a purpose used in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the example of this. He was steadfast in going to the cross, was he not? His, his face was set like flint, as Isaiah says. He was steadfast to the cross. He wasn't moved by the temptations of the devil. He abounded in his ministry. He endured the cross with joy. He is the perfect, spotless lamb of God. He is our example. He's already given us the victory, and he is our example to follow. Hebrews would say, we run our race with endurance, how? fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. He is the example of these things. And then we become steadfast and immovable. We start to abound in his work. And we know that that work isn't in vain in the Lord. Amen? Amen. There's one last thing I wanna point you to today. We have, we have four minutes left in this session. And this is, this is just a beautiful passage that, that the Holy Spirit put on my heart to call you guys to today. It made me think of the word abounding, overflowing. 
There's a section of scripture later, you can read it later in Ezekiel 47. And Ezekiel is in the temple and he has this vision from God. And in this vision, a river starts flowing out of the temple. And there's a man in the river. And and the man is in the river and he's calling Ezekiel into the river. And so Ezekiel, in this vision, he leaves the temple and he, he puts his feet in the river. And the Bible says he goes up to his ankles. And the man says, Ezekiel, a little bit deeper. So the Bible says Ezekiel goes up to his knees. The man says, hey, Ezekiel, a little deeper. And then it says Ezekiel goes up to his waist. But then the man calls Ezekiel the great faith, the man in the river, which I believe is none other than the Lord himself. And, and, and the man in the river says, Ezekiel, this is a river that, that you can't cross. He challenges Ezekiel, are you willing to give up completely and let the river take you? Because you can have some safe Christianity and just get your toes in there. Maybe up to your knees, maybe up to your waist. But Jesus calls Ezekiel in the river and the Bible says this was a river that could not be crossed. He was swept up in this river of God. And the Bible says there in Ezekiel 47 that the river went to the Dead Sea. I don't know if you've ever been to the Dead Sea. I've been there. You know why they call it the Dead Sea? Because everything is dead, dead, dead. The salinity, there's so much salt there that nothing can grow. There's no bacteria in the water. There's no plants along the bank. It is dead. But in this vision, Ezekiel gets swept up from the sanctuary of God, taken by this river. In faith, he he jumped into the river, fully abandoned, couldn't even swim. The river takes him down to the Dead Sea. And I wanna read for you two verses. Ezekiel 47, nine. This one will be on the screen. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. A place that was once dead now has life because the river went there. One more verse, Ezekiel 47, 12. Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. What was once dead is now life, Life life-giving. That's the picture that God is giving us in that story. There's some future pictures there of the river of God, the holy eternal city. But the meaning for us today that the Holy Spirit will allow us to take from this, I think two things I wanna challenge you men here today. Maybe there's someone here and you've never put your feet in the river. You're here today because you were invited to a men's breakfast. You don't know God. And there are some dead things in your life, stinky things. God wants to heal those things. He wants to bring life to those dead things. But you know what it's gonna take? Faith from you to be willing to be swept up by the river of God, to let the Holy Spirit take your life, to let Jesus be Lord of your life, fully commit to him. And then for the other group I wanna talk to is maybe some of us are only ankle deep, if we're being honest. We're the shallow soil. And today God brought you here because he wants to call you into the river fully. And it's time for you to say, okay, Lord, you get all of me. He wants to bring life to those dead areas of your life as well. And he wants to use you to bring healing to the nations. And so I'm gonna pray and we're gonna close this session, but the next session is gonna be a time of prayer and worship. And so as, as we have a 10 minute break, I want you to be thinking about that. And maybe in this next session, God would call you to come, come pray, ask for some prayer, give your life to Jesus, be swept up by the river of life. Maybe just a call to go deeper because you've been only ankle deep and you know who you are and it's time. And so Lord, thank you. God, thank you for your word, Lord. We wanna be steadfast for you, God. We thank you that you've done all the work. Lord, you died, you were buried, you rose again. You paid for our sins upon the cross. You rose from the grave, giving us eternal life. You are coming back again. You have guaranteed us resurrection, glory, resurrected bodies. You are coming to receive us into glory and you are coming to judge the world. And so we know these things matter. May you make us steadfast. May you make us immovable. May we be the type of Christian you've called us to be. May we abound in your work. May we serve you in this life. And may we know that it matters. May we have the eternal perspective. Lord, I pray if there's any here today 
that don't know you, you would call them into that river of glory that sweeps them up into the gospel of eternal life, Lord, and you would bring healing and health to their life, Lord. I pray, God, for those that are only ankle deep, you would call them deeper, and they would be willing, like Ezekiel, to be swept up by you, Lord, and fully abandoned in the gospel. Lord, we love you, we thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless